Hey guys, number one Marmaduke fan here. Uh, this is a continuation of my series looking at uh, Christians making comics because I'm interested in Christianity in the arts. So we're looking at Eden, a skillet graphic novel written by John Cooper and Random Shock, drawn by Chris Hunt, colored by Fred Stressing and Meg Casey. So uh, I enjoyed this book. I'm giving it a qualified recommendation. I think there's a really profound message to it, and I really admire John Cooper's uh, attitude on how Christians are supposed to approach the arts. Uh, I have some uh, kind of like comic nerd uh, cr criticisms of aspects of the, p the pacing and the visual presentation and the story, but I'll get to those as I'm kind of like flipping through the page. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, John Cooper and Skillet. So when I was in like a uh, Christian high school, I remember Skillet was like the hot, the hot band all of my classmates were listening to. And I was kind of like music illiterate, but I remember every time I listened to their music, I said, yeah, this is actually good, good music. And uh, John Cooper was in the like Christian news recently because there were some stories about uh, famous Christian musicians who had basically left the faith or said they either no longer had faith or at least were struggling with their faith. And so John Cooper, as a Christian musician, was interviewed about this. And he just gave a really solid interview where he basically what he laid out, I'm summarizing, is pe people shouldn't worship or idolize Christians in the arts because that sets you up for trouble. If you if you have a Christian hero who you think they're so heroic because of how popular they are, they will disappoint you. And that, that can't be the anchor of your faith, basically. So I was really impressed by that interview. I started listening to some Skillet right after that. And he gave, he, he's given some really solid interviews. I also uh, basically, oh, in, in one of the interviews I listened to, he described how uh, the goal of Skillet wasn't to make Christian rock music. The goal of Skillet was to make a really good rock band where the members were Christians. And so the, the expression of their Christian faith was to make good art, not to make crappy Christian art. So I 100% admire that. That's what I look for in artists. So now he's writing a comic, and I think he has exactly the right uh, attitude to how to approach the arts. My criticisms are pretty specific. Uh, and I think they're maybe like, uh, they're, they're kind of like a consequence of like a first timer j just breaking into it. So I would, I would recommend it based on how powerful I think his idea is and how excellently he expresses his religious idea in the context of a really interesting story and a fresh story. But, uh, basically hire me as an editor and, and I'll catch these kind of little things I'm going to quibble about. So now we're going to get into the, like the constructive criticism part of this, where I show you all my little o OCD uh, nitpicks, but I'll talk about like the really effective story as I go through. So first off, typo, typo on the first page. Ah, hire me as an editor. All right. So seriously, <laughs> hey, John Cooper of Skillet, if if you want me to be an editor, I will find typos like this. I'll do it for five bucks, man. I'll do it for you. All right. So she's leaning, right? So that's supposed to say lean, but the speech bubble is covering it up. So instead, it says Ian. Oh no. Oh no, that was the only typo I found. All the other stuff is a little bit more artistically subjective. So in the story, it's kind of like a creative spin on the zombie post-apocalyptic story where I kind of hate zombie stories because they've been done to death. But John has like a really fresh twist on it. So the main character, John, who kind of has some visual similarities to John Cooper, uh, he's been having these recurring dreams where uh, he sees a light and this light grows in intensity and it, it it takes the form of a door and he has a feeling from this light that everything's going to be okay and he's going to escape like the darkness of this present of this present world right so it's almost it's a mystical religious experience and he doesn't want to go to sleep because this this kind of this religious experience is so powerful he never wants to wake up and come back to earth and all of the, you know, evil and pain of this world. And it's having a weird effect where he and his wife and their children are starting to have their eyes glow purple, right? Which is really weird. People, people comment on that. So 
Our big setup is, I, I really love this metaphor and this image, actually. It's very memorable. It's very powerful. It's this weird, mystical, religious thing. So you can see John Cooper's faith is already informing his imagination a bit. But then I absolutely love what he does with this from a storytelling perspective, which is, yes, there's this powerful religious experience, but then there's also the potential that some weirdo cult will try to recruit you. So what we find out is there are these monsters uh, roaming the earth. Let me see if I can find a picture of them. And they, they, they kind of look like naked mole rats combined with bears. And I kind of love this because naked mole rats have always creeped me out. So he found something I was scared of that I didn't know I was scared of and just made it big and nasty. So uh, basically kind of like uh, in any post-traumatic, uh, what would it be? Not, not, not the apocalypse, but basically a cataclysm, you know, devastates our economy. The people are fighting wars over this new energy source. And then these evil creatures uh, come, come up from underground where we were mining for this new uh, resource and start wreaking havoc. And they're portrayed as being creepily intelligent. Like they may have near human intelligence and they have like really smart uh, hunting techniques, and people just assume they're dumb because they're they're big and lumbering, but they seem to be able to sneak up on us really well. Uh, while that's going on, everybody is obviously worried about why do these two people have glowing pur purple eyes? People are a little suspicious of, of that. And into town comes a cult group, and these cult group have purple eyes, and they call themselves uh, the Chosen, the uh, Lilac Lodge, and they give them this pitch that if you join us, uh, uh, oh fellow chosen, uh, we will open the door together and escape this evil reality. Now, I, I kind of instantly got the sense that this guy was a snake oil salesman. Look at that smarmy grin. All right, so what, what I like about this is the religious metaphor. We're now getting a deeper picture of that. Yes, the yes, it's good to have religion, but you got to watch out for the uh, what was it like the Kool Aid cults of the world that will use your sense of the spiritual, your understanding of the, gr the greater reality of the world as a way of getting you in, un getting their claws into you and controlling you. Now, John and his wife are instantly like suspicious of this. They have a family, they have a community. They're not buying what uh, he's selling. And so there's this nice, nice little political back and forth between the town and the creepy lilac cult and the town being suspicious of what's the deal. It, it, it's, it's a neat little political back and forth. Now, here's my, my first, my, here's where my first big criticism comes in. So there's the cult, and there are people who are not chosen. They don't have the purple eyes, but they are with the cult because he's promising that, well, you guys aren't chosen, but if you come with us and help us, we'll give you salvation, salvation too. Now, one of the problems is this, is this isn't very well communicated visually. So I'm going to show you when we meet the... Uh, two new people. So hopping forward a little bit, he kind of like wakes up, freaks out, and he goes to their camp. And then we meet two of the cult members who do not have the purple eyes. They're not chosen. Now, the problem is, this is the very first time we've seen them. And then John comes and talks with them. So my advice for writing comics is you have to write the comic under the assumption that an illiterate person is reading it. Because very often, <laughs> comics are for basically illiterate people. There, I said it, and I'm not taking it back either. So what you kind of need to do is if someone couldn't read, they should be able to understand what's going on still. So I would have something like when we meet the cult, we see the two important characters of the cult in who aren't, who they don't have the red rope. This was a good idea, actually. Give, give the people who are members of the cult proper, the chosen, the red robe to, sim to signal that they're special, they're part of the cult. But I would have, I don't know, like I'd have these two guys who are important characters, I don't know, give them like a little red scarf or something to show that they're connected with the cult, but they're not as special as the cult members. I'd have John like see them and kind of notice, oh look, there's a cybernetic girl with them. Now the way it's done is you meet the cult, you flip, here's two new people, you read it, He's talking to them. Are these members of the village? Oh, and then you have to go back and read it again. Okay, they're part of the cult, but they're not the chosen, right? So I had to read it twice to kind of put two and two to, together on that. If you, you, if you just have one little visual showing them as part of the group, you, you lose that confusion. Now, this happened to me a couple times while reading. So he goes and meets them, uh, and they're obviously not the chosen ones, but they are still hoping that maybe they can find escape escape from this world too. They do some kind of like cool backstory stuff about, you know, 
cyborg parts and fighting the monsters. I'm gonna flip ahead a little bit. So I'm gonna skip over a bunch of stuff, but there's a lot of like cool action adventure stuff. All right, now why did I highlight this? All right, so the, here's another issue again of this kind of thing happening where you don't, you don't, you can skip over stuff that's unimportant, but show everything important that happens. So they go to Memphis and they meet up with the pit, the, the, the couple cult members who are getting suspicious of the cult and they decide, okay, we figured out that our cult leader is an evil jerk. He, he's responsible for a lot of deaths. So we're going to work with you to take, to take him down. Right. So that's all cool stuff. But, uh, someone makes the comment that, uh, it's Jen and Seth. Uh, they're off the reservation. How'd they get out? The front door. Man, I tried to stop them, but that Jen chick, she like moved me. Now, we never saw this. We went straight from them leaving the reser reservation to them meeting up. And then this guy told us, oh, the robot girl uh, forced her way out. That seems pretty important, right? Like, like if I should ever have to remember something, there ought to be like a real quiet moment where you like show me the picture of it and you say, oh, it, it's just like indirecting. So indirecting, uh, you don't want to like find some, I don't know, unimportant character and then zoom in on his face really slowly and dramatically is like the ba 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 music is playing, right? Because what's everybody going to think? They're going to think, oh, this guy must be really important. He's not really important, right? Uh, but if something important happens like them busting off, them escaping the cult, that seems pretty important. You want to take a moment and show that. I'll show you one more example of that because uh, this is this is kind of a recurring problem. So uh, when this guy, Seth, yeah, Seth. So when the like gunner guy uh, realizes that the evil cult is going to uh, steal the, the town's power source and just leave them to be eaten by the monsters, he feels guilty about it. And so he said, figures, well, I can't just leave them like that. So he fires a warning shot and then that warning shot wakes them up and they wake up and they realize the monsters are attacking. Now you never see him fire the warning shot. He says, no, you turn the page, blam, they hear a gunshot, they wake up. Now this feels like, that feels like it's an important moment. He's kind of defying his cult leader. He's kind of being scummy because he's going along with the cult leader and leaving all these people to die. But he has enough of a conscience that he's pausing. He at least wants to give them a warning shot to wake him up and give him a fighting chance, right? So this is the kind of thing where because people reference this later and talk about this, I ought to see it in the comic book, especially if it's a big character moment. I should see him like defy the guy. I should see him like slowly raise the gun, fire it. Uh, I should see his expression while he's doing it. So I can see like this is a tough decision for him and he feels really bad about it. And I should see like the cult leader like glowering at him for daring to question his authority. And then they walk off into the distance. And so the, what that would tell me is, oh, this is really important. It's really important that he fired that warning shot. The warning shot's the only reason they woke up and fought and fought the monsters, right? Show me that important stuff and maybe skip over some of the little talky talky stuff or what would it be? Anything that where a character makes a decision that's a defining moment for them, I need to see that and I need to see the consequence. I, I need to see kind of like on their face the struggle as they go through that. Uh, there was a good example of this where the the married couple, John and his wife, go after them and they just cut to like Memphis. That's fine. I don't need to see him walking 90 miles an hour through a desert where nothing happens. That's boring. But you do have to show me the important stuff in a comic book because a comic book is a visual medium. In a novel, you could get away with some of this because you could have the narrator basically fleshing it out. The narrator could write paragraphs, kind of like explaining internal thoughts and things like that. But in a comic book, because comic book comic books are the dumb the dumb medium for little kids, you have to show the, you have to show pictures to the dumb to the dumb kids who read the comic book. That's the secret of writing comic books. Pretend the dumb little kid who can barely read is reading it, and show them pictures of all the important stuff. All right, so that was my criticism. That was my main criticism. One other minor criticism is some of the dialogue is a little uneven. So sometimes people will t speak with kind of like a Southern dialect. Ain't you going to do something about that? And then sometimes they'll speak with maybe a slightly more flowery uh, prose. And basically the trick I would do is I would only let the cult leader talk in flowery pro prose and I would have like other people 
talk in like more dumbed down language. They got through the door and then I'd have him say, ah, this is a most terrible situation indeed. But I wouldn't have like the regular hillbillies saying, ah, this is a most terrible situation. It, it makes contrast. Like if he's smart and everybody else is kind of a regular Joe, it makes him stand out a little bit more. I had an example of that, but I'm not going to find that a nitpick yet. Uh, so I want to return to the religious theme of this because I think it's really profound. And I, th this was the part of the comic I absolutely love. So we have this kind of deep religious sense that we can leave this world and escape this pain. But a cult is using that literally to mislead people and abuse people, find people who are isolated, alone. They've lost, they've lost people. They're abandoned and use their isolation as a way of getting their claws into them and controlling their lives, right? So that's a really great... That's actually how real world cults operate. So I appreciate that theme of it. And what the, what the heroes come to realize is that uh, being chosen is a responsibility. Being chosen isn't a privilege that you lord over other people. So the Christian connection to this is I kind of interpret this as a criticism of the left behind novels where the basic premise of the left behind novels is the Christians get raptured and we leave all the sinners behind. Ha ha ha, take that sinners. And so what Skillet is kind of saying is no, that shouldn't be your attitude. Your attitude shouldn't be let's get out of this world and leave everybody to, to heck, uh, let, let them all tear each other up. The Christian attitude should be to serve other people uh, diligently to sacrifice yourself for others. So being chosen isn't about joining the cult and being better than everybody else. Being chosen means taking on this responsibility to care for others, whether they're believers or not, which I think is really profound. Uh, I think it speaks volumes. He's, he's basically, he's, he's expressing an extremely profound uh, idea about the Christian life using kind of a cool adventure story in a post-apocalyptic post world to express that message. And I really appreciate that aspect of it. Uh, how would it be improved? I think what it needs is, I don't know, maybe someone who works in comics needs to look at it in the script phase and kind of like, so if John Cooper says, this is the story I want to tell, I've got this great big idea. The artist needs to think, okay, what are the important moments? Boop, boop, boop. Okay, this is an important moment. This is an important moment. This is an important moment. And make sure there's a drawing of those emotionally important moments so I can see that and I don't have some of the confusion later of trying to piece things together. So this was a qualified recommendation. Uh, I was kind of like in nitpick mode while I was reading this, but I did enjoy the, I, I really enjoyed uh, I. The, the world itself, the world itself is kind of fascinating. I like that it's a fresh, fresh take on kind of the zombie, the zombie genre. Uh, I think you could, you could tell more stories in this world. I really love like, yeah, the cult stuff is cool. The robot stuff is cool. The monsters are cool. That aspect of it is all cool. And I love the, I love uh, the approach of telling a religious message that isn't a sermon. It's a story. Absolutely. That's absolutely the correct approach to art. Uh, my nitpick is really just about make sure that you see visually what is important in the format of a comic. That's it. I recommend it. Check it out. Oh, and you can also download the song Dreaming of Eden by Skillet. So, uh, John Cooper, thank you for your uh, work in the art, sir. Th I appreciate your music. I really appreciate uh, what you've been uh, doing in your interviews, talking about your faith. I think you've got a really good talent for this. And uh uh, do, please keep making comics. I think you. I think you. I think you're onto something. All right, number one Marmaduke fan. I love you guys. Catch you later.